Okay, okay, dear colleagues, now we will uh, examine the issue of access uh, to employment and gender-based discrimination, just to have that uh, uh, phase of uh, employment relationship or pre-employment relationship as illustration of gender-based discrimination. Yes, they cannot hear us. I do yeah. hope, dear colleagues, colleagues, that you can hear us. Yes. Okay, great, great. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, so that is the issue that we are going to examine uh, now. Uh, when we are talking to access to employment, of course, that we have to mention right to work, fundamental right to work, right uh, of everyone to um, uh, freely choose occupation, to freely choose employment, and to uh, gain sources uh, for living for a worker and uh, also family members um, uh, on the basis of that work. Uh, of course, uh, right to work is important for uh, development of our personality because, of course, we do work to earn wages, but also we do work to, to uh, develop our personality through work, and work uh, has uh, a very important place in our identity, um, and uh, that's why uh, it is important to have in mind that, uh, of course, you can uh, exercise right to work by entering into employment relationship, but you can also exercise your right to work uh, like self-employed person or you can work in some other uh, way. Uh, and uh, right to work has uh, as its integral part actually uh, freedom of choice of uh, employment and freedom of choice of occupation. Uh, it is important for uh, everyone uh, to seek employment that uh, suits the best to our abilities, to our professional aspirations, to um, our life experience, to our work experience. Uh, and uh, our freedom to choose employment may be restricted exceptionally. Uh, of course, that uh, first uh, restriction is connected with the fact that our labor market has uh, some boundaries, territorial boundaries, but also uh, it is limited by uh, prescribing a so-called general occupational requirement, general employment requirement. General employment requir uh, requirement in uh, majority of European countries is connected with uh, minimum age that is prescribed as a condition for entering into employment relationship. And that requirement is prescribed uh, in abstract way regardless of the jobs that are going to be performed. But along with that, we do have special occupational requirements. Those requirements have to be uh, fulfill fulfilled uh, depending on the type of the job that you are uh, actually submitting application for as a job seeker, as a job candidate. Uh, those uh, special occupational requirements are usually connected with uh, knowledge, with skills, and sometimes that can even be uh, connected with uh, some personal characteristics that are of importance for successful performance um, of working tasks that uh, are covered by a certain job. Uh, and uh, that means that in exceptional cases, even certain sex can be prescribed as a a male or female sex can be prescribed as a special occupational requirement if that sex is actually um, uh, uh, determining a, a requirement for successful performance of um, uh, working task or genuine requirement for successful performing of working tasks. Uh, when it comes to employer, employer do, uh, does have uh, actually um, uh, a f a freedom to choose uh, uh, collaborates to choose uh, uh, workers, to choose um, uh, uh, future employees. Uh, that uh, freedom to choose employees is quite um, wide and it is based on the freedom of entrepreneurship if we are talking about that type of uh, employer, <coughs> but also freedom of contract. And of course, we have to always have in mind responsibility of employer to ensure proper functioning of um, enterprise or other uh, working conditions. And if we have a combination of those freedoms and responsibility, then we have to have in mind that uh, Actually, 
uh, employer has a significant freedom in choosing future employees. Employer can make a difference between job candidates, but cannot discriminate uh, them. Uh, so uh, this position of employer is determined not just um, uh, by his legal prerogatives, but also uh, by his uh, or her economic dominance, as well as the fact that there are very few people that can afford themselves a luxury not to uh, perform a paid uh, work for um, employment. Um, when it comes to uh, exercise of uh, right to work in the frame of employment relationship, we can speak about uh, hiring process and uh, recruiting process. Uh, in uh, those procedures, uh, main actors are job seekers and employers, but we can also have uh, as an actor in that process, for example, public employment service or private agencies, private employment agencies, and so on. Those are actors that are actually present in the process of hiring. Process of hiring is connected, of course, with establishing occupational requirements, but it also covers uh, announcing job vacancies, submitting job applications, testing uh, applicants' abilities, deciding on job applications, entering into employment uh, contract, and all those phases of uh, hiring proced procedures or hiring process or recruiting process are actually uh, connected with the risk of discrimination and also with the risk of gender-based discrimination. And we will try to see where that risk of gender-based discrimination is actually when it comes to um, uh, each of those uh, uh, phases of a hiring process. Uh, of course, um, uh, we have to have in mind that uh, labor market in which uh, there is a uh, um, uh, access to certain uh, jobs uh, is uh, marked by occupational segregation. We've already uh, said a few words about uh, that, uh, which means that um, uh, there is a, a, a custom to uh, give preference to workers of one sex when hiring for certain um, jobs. Uh, and. Uh, of course, that is uh, stimulated by stereotypes that are connected with uh, productivity of male or female workers, decency of performing certain jobs, uh, authenticity that is needed for performance of certain jobs, uh, and so on. It depends on um, uh, jobs. Uh, and uh, when it comes to establishing occupational requirements, uh, as we said, uh, uh, occupational requirements are mostly connected with um, uh, for example, uh, knowledge, skills, uh, and some similar uh, requirements, uh, but uh, uh, there is an obligation of employer to select uh, job candidates uh, on the basis of their knowledge, on the basis of uh, their skills, that is uh, to say on the basis of uh, merits, uh, and uh, to uh, select candidates um, for the job in good uh, occupational requirements, as a rule, uh, have to be directly related to a specific job. Uh, and uh, the risk of uh, direct and indirect gender-based discrimination is mostly connected with the fact that uh, some occupational requirements are established, although they are not of importance for successful performance of working tasks on certain job, which can uh, actually lead to uh, uh, discrimination uh, of uh, female workers or male workers. Uh, of course, direct discrimination, I know that you are all familiar with, uh, with that notion, uh, will exist if certain sex is established as a requirement for a job in which it isn't necessary for successful performance of duties for a worker to be of male or female sex. Uh, that would be a direct discrimination, meaning that you are treating uh, differently workers who are uh, in same or similar position, which means that they uh, do have same knowledge, same skills of importance for performance of working tasks, but you are introducing a new uh, requirement, requirement regarding uh, a certain sex, although it is not uh, necessary for uh, performing uh, working tasks. So discrimination is connected with um, unjustified uh, different treatment 
um, of job candidates on the basis of a certain personal characteristic, and in this case, that would be uh, a sex. Uh, regarding that, uh, I would like to ask you uh, one question, so if you like, you can answer. Is there a discrimination in decision of the director uh, of a fishing magazine not to hire a woman for a position of a journalist due to the belief that she would be uncomfortable and unhappy to work in an all-male work environment? So we have a, a ma magazine dedicated to the issues of fishing. Uh, and uh, all employees uh, in that um, uh, newspaper agency are um, uh, male workers. Uh, there was uh, a hiring procedure. Uh, there were many candidates, the best of them regarding knowledge, skills, and all other uh, requirements um, was a female candidate, but um, uh, m employer or director of that magazine decided uh, not to uh, hire women because uh, he truly believes, deeply believes that uh, uh, female journalists will be unhappy and uh, uh, not satisfied with, with that job since uh, this is all male um, uh, magazine um, uh, editorial board. So what do you think? Is there a discrimination uh, in this decision? Please, colleague Šundović. Hello. Well, in this case, for this job, uh, there are no uh, special uh, personal pro properties uh, to to involve in uh, that uh, labor, uh, I mean, job. So in that case, uh, that uh, for sure is a discrimination uh, uh, because of uh, some uh, un uh, ungrounded uh, okay, uh, occasions and uh, reasons. Okay, yeah, okay, you, you uh, think that uh, here we do have discrimination and that we can uh, qualify decision of director of this magazine as discriminatory uh, since um, uh, sex is not that personal characteristic that is uh, determining an occupation, uh, occupational requirement or genuine occupational requirement which is necessary for successful performance of um, this job. Okay, are there other uh, uh, conclusions? Yes, colleague Mijovic. Uh, I think that in first line, it looks like a discrimination, but in the other hand, I think that employer um, maybe in that way want to protect that person and maybe to protect their mental health and um, other things uh, which she can face maybe working in that place. Okay, thank you. Thank you, colleague Mijovic. Okay, are there some, some other opinions? Yes, Stefan, please. Bjelicic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, hello. I think it is discrimination because he decided based on his stereotypes um, on women. That, that was the, the core of the, what has made him to not um, hire her, that, because that's the discrimination. Well, Stefan is familiar with the decision, but okay. Yes, Shuidovic, please. Uh, well, I had a quick look uh, at uh, our positive law, and I and I found out that uh, there are uh, violations of uh, articles uh, in uh, labor law and in uh, law against uh, discrimination, uh, concretely Article 23 in law of. Uh, uh, this about discrimination, meaning uh, uh, there is no, uh, there ca can be no discrimination in uh, terms of uh, labor in, and also in terms in terms of violation of uh, equal opportunities for everyone to engage in a labor uh, relation. Okay, th okay, thank you. Uh, well. Uh, this can be qualified as discrimination, and this can be qualified as direct discrimination, uh, because decision of 
uh, uh, that director of magazine uh, was uh, actually based on stereotype, which uh, colleague Bialicic said, uh, stereotype that uh, uh, women uh, would not be um, uh, welcome in that uh, uh, magazine or uh, would not feel uh, well in that uh, environment if uh, uh, she has uh, just uh, male colleagues. And of course, there are other stereotypes that are not expressed uh, in, in this decision, and that is what uh, uh, women do know about fishing, uh, they do not share that passion like men for fishing and so on and so on. So this is a direct discrimination because you actually are not expressly introducing um, uh, male sex as an occupational requirement, but actually do prevent uh, women to um, uh, be employed uh, solely because of uh, certain stereotypes that um, uh, you have regarding um, uh, female workers. Yes? Dear, dear I have one question about this case. Uh, and in all other cases concerning employment, how are we to know if we are that w the best candidate? The c informations are not disclosed about the candidate. How did she know that she's the most, I mean, that's really important question. Mm -hmm. uh, concretely, when it comes to this case, there was a shortlisting process which co which uh, included uh, some points that were given uh, for knowledge, for skills. Uh, they had uh, some testing, including writing an article, writing a column on a certain uh, issue, and um, uh, there was uh, a ranking among uh, job candidates on the basis of different criteria, which were uh, previous previously uh, prescribed in um, rule book uh, of the employer and uh, in that way um, it was uh, actually as yes, possible to, to, to uh, give evidence that uh, she was uh, the best candidate uh, uh, if we have in mind formal criteria for choosing an employee. But of course when it comes to discrimination in general but also especially discrimination in employment uh, very challenging issue is how to prove that there is a discrimination because uh, most of those cases are happening um, just uh, um, uh, during the interview with the hiring committee and employee or just employer and em employer representative not hiring committee and employee and uh, what is that decision that what is the fact that uh, actually influenced uh, director's decision uh, director <laughs> would only knows but this uh, it was the reason uh, for not hiring uh, the female candidate that was uh, actually um, explained um, uh, in uh, the, the answer of um, uh, this director in the case. Yes, colleague? Uh, so in those cases, uh, is actually the biggest obstacle uh, to, for a victim to uh, prove to be uh, probable the, uh, the discrimination in order to uh, burden of uh, proof uh, goes to accused one. Yes, there is a transfer of burden of proof um, to uh, actually employer, from claimant to employer. Uh, so uh, it is on um, uh, employee or job candidate uh, just to um, uh, give some, uh, uh, some uh, indications that uh, their um, is possibly uh, gender-based discrimination, but it is an employer to uh, prove that uh, um, uh, there is uh, uh, actually working environment which is uh, in line with the principle of gender equality and that um, uh, there is, uh, for example, some um, uh, strategies or plans regarding uh, diversity, gender equality plans, that uh, many employees are uh, female workers, they are uh, advancing in a career, they are um, represented in all different uh, levels of jobs and so on and so on. That could be some, some, some kind of uh, 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 evidence for other cases. But in this case, there was no um, uh, a possibility for employer to, uh, to prove that uh, there was no 
discrimination and even more uh, employers said that uh, decision was in order to, as Milica said, to protect uh, a women because she will be unhappy and employer of course is obliged to take care about health of employees and that is not just uh, physical health but also their mo mo mental health and social well-being. Maybe that is the reason why Milica said that but of course here we do have direct discrimination uh, as a legal qualification of this um, uh, decision. Uh, on the other hand, when it comes to indirect discrimination of job candidates, uh, it is uh, usually established by, you, we all know that definition, by seemingly neutral um, a provision, criterion, or uh, practice, uh, and uh, the application of them uh, will put job seekers of one sex uh, at a disadvantage comparing to other uh, workers. Uh, that is usually uh, the case with prescribing uh, certain physical characteristics as a special occupational requirement. Uh, for example, uh, uh, certain height, uh, weight, uh, body mass index, uh, strength, and so on. Uh, those are uh, actually uh, uh, occupational requirements that are of importance for successful performance of many demanding jobs. But if you um, uh, establish uh, as special requirements, special height, weight, body mass index for jobs where this is not of importance for successful performance of um, working tasks, in those cases there will be indirect um, uh, discrimination. Um, so we have to have that uh, in mind. Uh, and uh, there is an one exception. Uh, so, in principle, you cannot establish as an employer uh, certain sex as occupational requirement, but if certain sex is genuinely determining occupational requirement, that it can be established. If certain sex is uh, uh, so important for performance of job that you are not uh, in a position to perform properly working conditions, then it is acceptable to have male or female sex as a special uh, occupational requirement. Uh, we can say that in those cases there are reasons of professional necessity that can actually um, uh, uh, represent objective reasons for introducing certain sex as occupational requirement. Uh, those reasons of professional necessity are usually connected with authenticity, with decency, with the nature of institution in which um, uh, working tasks are um, uh, actually performed, uh, and so on. Yes, dear colleague, you want yeah, to... Yeah, maybe is prison guards should be in female prisons more. Yes, you're right. When it comes to penitentiary institutions, yes, uh, it is acceptable to have a male or female uh, sex as a, um, a, a special uh, occupational requirement because of decency and because of security reasons. If uh, that is a penitentiary uh, institution uh, in which uh, we have just uh, male or uh, female prisoners. Uh, also, when it comes, for example, to decency, it won't be um, uh, discriminatory to set as a special occupational requirement a female sex uh, if a worker uh, has to uh, perform household work or to take care about uh, older family member or person with disability who is a family member of female sex because uh, employee uh, will have um, access to intimate details uh, from the life of that uh, person. Uh, or um, it won't be discriminatory to have um, a female sex as a, um, uh, for example, uh, occupational uh, requirement uh, in um, uh, jobs where um, uh, uh, you have a special um, relationship between um, uh, 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 employer's clients and employee, as is the case with midwives. 
but we have to be very careful because there is a risk to actually have some stereotypes connected with the reasons of decency as uh, objective reason for introducing certain sex as occupational requirement. For example, when it comes to midwives, uh, there was one case before the European Court of Justice, uh, whether or not it is discriminatory to um, uh, set as an occupational requirement female sex for midwives. Uh, and the uh, court found that uh, there is no discrimination, having in mind that special relationship between patient and um, uh, uh, employee in that uh, delicate and sensitive uh, uh, period. Uh, but it is on uh, member states to regularly uh, review uh, that uh, exception uh, in order to be in line with um, uh, those uh, differences that are going to be introduced in the labor market in, um, in the future. And that was the case um, um, against uh, uh, United Kingdom. Uh, and uh, uh, after uh, the judgment was um, adopted, uh, United Kingdom changed uh, rules concerning education for midwives and uh, possibilities uh, of employment of uh, midwives in order to allow uh, male workers to perform th that job. And that was also the case with um, other uh, EU member candidates. Uh, on the other hand, reasons uh, for allowing uh, employers to introduce certain sex as an uh, uh, occupational requirement can be connected with uh, authenticity. Uh, this is especially the case with um, um, arts, uh, culture, and so on. So it would be discriminatory to uh, set uh, of male sex as occupational requirement for jobs of actors, ballet dancers, opera singers in theaters, and so on. Uh, because, of course, uh, for the reasons of authenticity, it is um, uh, of importance for um, uh, actor or singer or dancer to be of certain sex. Of course, here we can say, uh, uh, have a little comma because it is possible having in mind artistic freedom to um, uh, uh, have some exceptions if uh, you have some modern or some extravagant or some, some other um, vision as uh, for example director of a play you can uh, have uh, 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 those changes um, then um, uh, when it comes to um, uh, uh, other reasons of uh, professional uh, uh, necessity, we mentioned decency, and regarding that, I would uh, kindly ask you to think about uh, this example. Uh, could a male sex be a genuine professional qualification for the job of a salesman in a men's clothing store? What do you think? We have a job candidate for uh, the job of sales I said man, but maybe it would be better to say salesperson, uh, in a men's clothing store, having in mind uh, that reasons concerning decency. <laughs> would it be discriminatory uh, to uh, have uh, uh, male sex as an occupational requirement uh, in this type of job because of the reasons of decency? What do you think? <laughs> Maybe someone in the chat <laughs> has some idea, just to see. Ah, Maria Molovic wrote a long answer. It comes down, but unfortunately, give the answer if they want. Um, um, Maria, thank you very much for the answer, but it refers to the um, last question, not this one. But what about our sale, salesperson in a men's clothing store? Just think about working tasks that uh, this uh, job of salesperson covers, and are there actually some contacts between uh, salespersons and um, uh, employers' clients? that could be uh, of importance for, from the perspective of decency? And uh, are there some other reasons that could actually approve this? What do you think? Would it be discriminatory? No one has an idea? What would you say? 
Mina, yes? Well, yeah, it's definitely difficult to draw a line in this regard. So in this case, because like on one hand, this kind of job isn't the first thing that comes to my mind when I think about decency. Like there are some other jobs that are my first instance of thinking. But on the other hand, when we take into account the fact that the salesperson may be helping with the sizes and different, like in this regard, we can take account the, the requirements of, of decency. Yes, sizes, but also, for example, if there is a need for uh, clothing repairs, uh, then that, that, that can be connected with some contacts that uh, can be, uh, from the uh, perspective of reason of decency, may be problematic. Uh, and uh, th yes, please, colleague. Uh, my que I have a question to this question. Why is it uh, problematic that uh, female takes measure of a man and it's not problematic that a female a tailor takes measures of a man? I mean, because we have female tailor who takes measures on my husband when he's preparing suits. So why is this problematic? I mean, this is discrimination. <laughs> yes, that's so over my it. question. Is yeah, it's so discrimination open discrimination. Or not? Uh, no. Here, uh, we have a men's clothing store. And there was occupational requirement for job candidates to be um, uh, male uh, workers because of uh, that contact with customers when taking measures for clothing repairs. And that was the question for the court, whether or not was there was a discrimination. So you think that uh, this was uh, discriminatory. Uh, and uh, colleague Mina was... <laughs> Not uh, uh, for me, it was obviously discriminatory. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But how to explain that? Maybe there are customers who would feel uncomfortable uh, for a person of uh, I would say opposite exactly sex. what uh, this, uh, uh, mm -hmm. Larissa said. There are so many tailors, male, female, for yes. so there is no. Yeah, why are we why are we introducing sexuality into this? I'm I'm I mean we're we're crossing the lines here, so we're. They're crossing. Yeah, we're introducing. Yeah, they're yeah actually this this. Uh, employer. Yeah, this employer, employer is crossing the line. I mean he's yes. introducing stereotypes and uh, s sexual discourse into something that should not be sexualized. Why? Why should be sexual? Well. That was uh, the uh, explanation uh, of employer that it is not acceptable for that very famous men's clothing store to have uh, female um, uh, salespersons. Uh, but court found this measure, as uh, you and professor said, discriminatory, and uh, explained that uh, at the same time there were uh, male workers uh, in uh, this. Uh, uh, men's clothing store, uh, and if there is a need for uh, repairs, then uh, they could uh, perform those tasks. So both men and women can be hired for the job in question. So that was that was the question. Okay, thank you for the answer. Uh, uh, okay, uh, also. Um, uh, those reasons of professional necessity um, uh, that can justify introducing occupational requirements uh, uh, that are male or female sex uh, can be connected with the nature of institution in which um, uh, certain um, uh, working tasks are performed. As we mentioned, penitentiary institutions are a um, uh, good example, but also uh, if certain working tasks uh, have to be performed, for example, in um, a foreign country where due to a specific um, a national legal system or customs or uh, culture, it is not allowed uh, or appropriate for women to perform working tasks. In those cases, it would be uh, permissible for employer to introduce uh, male sex as occupational requirement uh, for uh, uh, candidates for this job. Uh, because it won't be possible for um, uh, female workers to perform in that foreign country um, uh, uh, those uh, working tasks. Uh, also, that was the case uh, with um, uh, some uh, uh, jobs uh, where uh, actually working tasks are performed um, uh, in a place where for employer it is not practical or even possible uh, to um, uh, uh, organize work without employees living in the premises of uh, employer. 
and uh, it is not reasonable to expect uh, that the employer will uh, provide uh, separate, uh, for example, dormitories or sanitary um, uh, facilities for men and women. For example, if you have a job of light housekeeper or you have uh, uh, workers on oil rig in the middle of the sea, etc., in those cases, it is uh, actually um, uh, uh, permissible to uh, set uh, as occupational requirement female sex or male sex. Uh, uh, then um, uh, we have to have in mind if we have those exceptions, uh, so if certain sex do represent genuine determining occupational requirement, uh, it is on uh, states to periodically review uh, justifiability of this uh, exception, uh, to periodically review it, and uh, to prevent those exceptions to cover all uh, jobs in certain working environment. Uh, that can be illustrated by one very uh, important so-called landmark judgment of the European Court of Justice, uh, which was connected with um, uh, the possibility of female workers to be employed uh, in uh, military uh, because there was a ban on employing women uh, in military service uh, on all jobs that uh, include uh, use of weapons. And that actually led uh, to uh, the fact that uh, it was unlawful to uh, employ women uh, in all other jobs with the exception of uh, military health service jobs and military orchestras. And according to European Court of Justice, that was actually discrimination. Although you can, of course, have some, some jobs where um, female sex uh, or male sex uh, are a uh, genuine occupational requirement, here if that is connected with the exclusion, uh, of um, uh, access to uh, majority of jobs in working conditions without uh, objective reason for that, then there is a place for uh, qualification of discrimination. Yes? So I, I do not want to, to, to interrupt Pro Professor Ljubinka, but just to uh, tell that we have uh, almost around, only uh, around 40 minutes before the end, and I know that she has so, it's obvious how relevant this course is and how you can go on and with so rich knowledge and information involve us all really in, in a very interesting lectures and the, the discussion. However, uh, Ljubinka has one more uh, uh, lecture on disability, at least okay. shortly to cover and before I, before you continue, just to, to tell you, I, I'm not sure, I think that I forgot to tell that when I was presenting all those books wi which we uh, had published within the Logia project. I brought it, but I said a bit about each of the others, but the book on disability, which uh, Professor Ljubinka edited, it's something fantastic. It was firstly based on the conference which we had here, the faculty, in the international one, a very successful one with the UN women supporting us. But then on the basis of that conference and with much uh, bigger uh, number of uh, participants, we got extraordinary relevant book uh, about the intersectional discrimination uh, on, of women and girls with disabilities. So we, we are really honored to hear from you at, at least uh, in short, the main points, and I think that I forgot to upload that book, uh, and I will do that. I think I did not do that. I will do it today, so you will witness how how rich and important that book is. So okay. I apologize. No, no, thank you very much, dear professor, for this intervention. Yes, there will be sufficient time for intersectional discrimination of women with disabilities, but let's try to of course, um, uh, sum, sum up uh, those issues that are of importance for access to uh, employment. Uh, well, then we'll skip uh, uh, some uh, interesting case uh, which uh, concerns um, uh, uh, female uh, uh, workers uh, or female can candidates for the job 
of uh, marines, but since professor said that we do not have time for that, maybe you can, you can examine that uh, at home. Um, uh, well, uh, when it comes to job advertisements and job applications, the issue of gender-based discrimination is very important and delicate. Uh, briefly, we can say that uh, restriction of employers' prerogatives in the field of employment uh, includes ban on publishing discriminatory advertisements uh, for job vacancies. Uh, also, uh, advertisements in which you can find gender wording of job titles, for example, titles stewardess, fireman, etc., as I said, salesman, not salesperson, etc., because that indicate an employer's intention to actually uh, give a priority to uh, workers of certain uh, sex. In some uh, uh, countries, there were experiments with um, uh, so called blind hiring or anonymous or uh, depersonalized job applications, which included um, uh, the possibility for hiring committee uh, to actually be aware of the sex of job candidate only after shortlisting. So before the decision about the candidates that will be included in shortlisting um, is made, uh, those uh, members of hiring committees were not uh, familiar with the sex of uh, uh, job candidates, in some cases with the age of job candidates, because uh, applications uh, did not contain uh, name, maiden name of job candidate, uh, then uh, data concerning military service, breaks in a career because of uh, maternity leave and so on, in order to prevent hiring committee to make a decision based on stereotypes and prejudice that are connected with um, uh, uh, certain uh, sex. Uh, then uh, when it comes to pre-employment testing of employees, this is also the phase of uh, recruitment process which is um, accompanied by uh, the risk of gender-based discrimination, uh, especially when it comes to physical ability uh, tests. Why? Because those tests are usually developed on the basis of a model of universal worker, and that universal worker is actually a male uh, worker who is of uh, young age, uh, and usually of uh, certain, it has dominant ethnicity, and uh, Although it is possible to uh, reliably um, evaluate uh, professional capabilities of um, uh, job candidates on the basis of other tests that are actually uh, not connected with uh, bad results uh, concerning uh, uh, male candidates, uh, employers do uh, 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 continue to uh, actually um, implement those uh, tests that favor uh, male candidates of certain ethnicity and of certain um, age. That's why it is very important to regulate the evaluation of capabilities of uh, job candidates and uh, to um, uh, uh, have uh, valid, uh, reliable uh, criteria for um, uh, selecting and recruiting uh, job candidates. When it comes with, uh, to interviews with job uh, candidates, of course, that is always a delicate issue. How to prevent employers to um, uh, ask about uh, family planning, uh, which is, of course, uh, connected with um, discrimination of female workers, usually young female workers, uh, and uh, how to uh, prevent employers uh, to uh, ask uh, uh, candidates for managerial jobs about previous managerial experience, the ability to fit into organizational culture where organization is dominated by men, and so on. Uh, that is a really uh, very delicate and important issue. Of course, that there is a need for um, oversight of the recruiting process, but it is not sufficient. Uh, of course, we can rely on uh, labor inspectors, we can rely on trade union representatives. For example, in many legal systems, trade union representatives are present during the interviews with job candidates in order to prevent employers to ask those questions concerning family planning and other uh, questions, uh, let's say off-limits questions. Uh, in some legal systems also, uh, candidates has uh, the right not to answer to employers off-limits questions. Explicit norm in uh, laws is prescribed. Um, uh, and then also we have legal systems in which there is a right of job candidate to give a false answer 
to lie about pregnancy or, or some other um, um, issue that is gender related and uh, that will not have as a consequence termination of employment if uh, that uh, candidate is elected and uh, um, uh, entered into employment relationship uh, because uh, this is uh, not uh, considered as uh, a violation of the principle of good uh, faith and the employer cannot claim mistake of fact regarding uh, essential characteristics of uh, that um, employee. So that is also one interesting uh, issue that you have to can be uh, uh, mentioned. Yes, dear colleague, please. So uh, it's uh, possible to, to cover uh, that you're pregnant at the interview, for instance. So employer cannot, f uh, I mean, sue you, sue you for that that you didn't disclose that information. That yes, is in those legal systems, yes, where you have actually that rule that you can um, uh, skip the answer or give a false answer to employers off-limits questions, uh, there is no uh, consequence um, uh, like uh, a termination for employment uh, uh, because there is no violation of the principle of good faith, nor there is a, a, a mistake of fact regarding uh, characteristics of a job. Of course, that is a quite complex issue. We can imagine that a uh, job candidate is a candidate uh, uh, for a, a job of actor who has to um, uh, take part in um, uh, producing a movie. Uh, everything is organized, uh, employer paid everything, uh, um, employer engages uh, actress uh, for a certain period of time in order to, to make a movie and uh, uh, suddenly uh, employer finds out that uh, em employee is actually a pregnant and there won't be a possibility for her to, to perform working tasks properly. So we can say, well, uh, there are legit legitimate uh, interests and uh, of course uh, uh, costs for um, uh, employer. Is it fair uh, to say, well, uh, uh, there is no violation of the principle of good faith, uh, but we always have to have in mind that employer is not a weaker party to employment rela relationship, employee is a weaker party to employment relationship, and uh, employer uh, uh, does have uh, a, a wide dispersion of, of uh, entrepreneurial uh, risks and chances uh, in comparison to, to um, employee. Um, so uh, that is also one phase which is uh, very um, uh, uh, jeopardized by uh, the risk of gender-based discrimination. Uh, as we said, uh, one exception from the ban uh, on introducing uh, certain uh, sex as an uh, occupational requirement is connected with the situations in which certain sex do repre does represent uh, actually a genuine and determining occupational requirement. But there is one more exception. Uh, in which uh, it is permissible for employers to uh, uh, give a priority uh, to workers of certain uh, sex because uh, there are some objective reasons for that. Of course, we are talking about uh, so-called positive action measures or affirmative action measures or um, a preference treatment uh, and so on. We have even uh, uh, the use of the notion positive discrimination. Uh, although there are many differences between those notions depending on uh, legal systems uh, that we are talking about. Uh, but uh, yes, one exception uh, is of course um, uh, connected with those positive measures. Briefly, since Professor said that we do not have uh, much time for uh, this uh, issue to be examined, uh, positive action measures are actually measures introduced by competent public authorities, they're always temporary measures, and they are introduced in favor of certain vulnerable groups. Those groups uh, are usually minority groups, by, but uh, that is not necessary, as is the case with female workers. Um, and uh, those measures are usually connected with priority in employment or some other uh, preferential treatment that you 
provide for uh, vulnerable groups in order to uh, obtain uh, de facto equality, in order to uh, obtain uh, 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 integration of those uh, categories of workers that are traditionally facing uh, problems to find a job, to maintain the job, to advance in a career. Uh, and uh, there is a possibility to introduce positive action measures um, uh, regarding uh, workers of underrepresented sex. Underrepresented sex in certain sector, in certain branch of industry, in certain enterprise or other working environment. And uh, I have to admit that uh, experiences of uh, EU member states regarding those positive action measures are uh, not so good if we uh, um, uh, have in mind long-term effects of the change that you want to, to make. For example, in Nordic countries, we have uh, positive action measures in favor of male workers when it comes to jobs in kindergartens, because uh, males are not stimulated to, to uh, work in kindergartens because of stereotypes concerning um, uh, uh, yeah. care uh, for children and also because of lower wages. Uh, but. Uh, there are also uh, some uh, uh, very reliable scientific uh, research result that shows that it is very important for uh, children to uh, actually uh, have in kindergartens employees who are of uh, different uh, sexes, who are of uh, different ethnicities, uh, and so on, but especially when it comes to participation of uh, male employees because of uh, those uh, new um, trends that we have um, uh, regarding alternative forms of uh, family life, uh, single parents, mother single parents, and when, uh, of course, we don't have time for that, but uh, uh, when it comes to boys that uh, uh, are growing up with a uh, uh, single parent mother, uh, then um, it is problematic to find um, that male uh, uh, figure. Uh, and if uh, it is not present in the family nor in the kindergarten, then uh, it will be actually um, uh, introduced uh, from, yes, it will be introduced um, uh, from uh, the media or some pop popular culture when we know what is the uh, male model. That's why, for example, in Nordic countries you have many incentives uh, in, uh, regarding educating and employing uh, uh, boys uh, in uh, those jobs or, or um, um, and those uh, um, uh, those uh, uh, educational programs, yes. And in chat, Lucia Urin, yes, it could be discriminatory in Western civilization. Well, yes, 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 yes. yes. Uh, unfortunately, uh, <laughs> I have some problems with chat. Do do I do apologize, dear colleague Lucia, for not um, uh, reading uh, in due time uh, your uh, comment. Um, uh, and also there are, of course, uh, uh, positive action measures in favor of uh, female uh, job candidates. And uh, uh, we had many uh, important judgments uh, of European Court of Justice regarding this issue, especially judgments in cases uh, Bade, Kalanke, uh, Abrahamson, uh, and so on. And uh, since we don't have time to analyze all those judgments, I will just sum up. Uh, what is uh, the conclusion of um, uh, the court? Uh, well, yes, uh, states are allowed to introduce uh, positive action measures in favor of workers uh, that are of underrepresented sex in certain working environment, but only if those so-called quotas, quotas for employing women or quotas for employing men, uh, are not unconditional and not automatic. You, you cannot uh, give automatic and unconditional advantage in employment to women or men compared to um, uh, workers of uh, opposite sex uh, if they have same uh, abilities. Uh, and then uh, it is very important that uh, employer makes an objective assessment of the candidate's abilities with the possibility to take into account specific personal circumstances on each candidate. Uh, why? Because it is possible to have, for example, if we have enterprise where um, uh, male workers are overrepresented, it is possible uh, that you have uh, 
quota for female workers, but at the same time you have candidate who is uh, a male and who is, uh, for example, war veteran, which means that on his side you have a reason uh, which uh, is uh, of greater legal weight when it comes to giving a priority. So it is not allowed to have automatic priority for person of certain sex, although you have quotas for persons of certain sex. Okay, so that's all when it comes to access to employment. And we minutes. have 20 minutes for, <laughs> for these everything. issues. Yes, yes, but we will succeed. Thank you, dear professor. Yes. Well, last issue that we are going to examine is the issue of intersectional discrimination of women with disabilities. Uh, I know that you are familiar with that concept of intersectionality, although it is so delicate and not clear, uh, <laughs> uh, really, uh, very uh, delicate legal issue. But uh, we can say that, of course, that category of female workers uh, is not uniform, that we have uh, different uh, uh, subgroups or groups in that category, and some of them uh, are facing uh, serious and severe problems to find a job, to maintain the job, or to advance in a career. Among them, very delicate position is the position of uh, women with disabilities. Uh, people with disabilities represent 15% of uh, the world population, and 54% uh, uh, of those persons with disabilities are actually women with disabilities that are of uh, the age um, uh, of uh, uh, 15 to uh, 64, meaning that uh, they're uh, capable to enter into employment relationship. Uh, they encounter significant obstacles uh, when it comes to exercising right to work. Uh, reasons for those obstacles are different, uh, starting with negative stereotypes that uh, employers do have regarding employment of persons with disabilities. Uh, especially the stereotype that persons with disabilities and women with disabilities also are less productive, less flexible than uh, workers without disabilities, uh, that persons with disabilities will use uh, extended sick leave or be absent because of medical rehabilitation more than other workers will that hiring persons with disabilities is uh, connected with uh, uh, high costs because of the need to uh, uh, provide uh, reasonable accommodation of working process, working equipment, work organization to special needs that persons with disabilities do have, uh, and so on. Then uh, one of the reasons is connected with uh, the lack of appropriate transportation to work and back. Uh, then uh, we have uh, some uh, occupational requirements uh, that are uh, introduced by certain employers uh, connecting with uh, strength, uh, physical abilities, and so on, although uh, they are not necessary for successful performance of working tasks, which can lead to um, uh, discrimination. Uh, also, there, there are problems with um, uh, uh, pre-employment testing because tests uh, are uh, usually uh, modeled uh, for persons uh, who um, are not persons with disabilities. Then we have statistical stereotypes also because um, uh, we have stereotypes which reflect uh, statistical data on uh, workers with disabilities that most of them will not be capable to perform uh, certain jobs, but uh, that, that um, uh, do not necessarily reflect the situation on specific worker and so on. Those are main reasons, some of main reasons why uh, actually uh, persons with disabilities encounter uh, obstacles in enjoying their uh, right to work. Of course, that will uh, also um, uh, depends on uh, the type of disabilities. For example, um, uh, the most severe obstacles uh, are uh, connected with employment of persons with uh, mental disorders, severe mental disorders, because in order to uh, have uh, that workplace um, uh, accommodated, reasonably accommodated to the needs of that employee, uh, you will have to provide assistance for that employee and then to, to provide other working conditions um, and so on. Uh, while some other uh, employees with disabilities, for example, those uh, disabilities that are connected with uh, damaged skin, uh, 
will not have uh, some obstacles, important obstacles, in order to find a job in comparison to other uh, workers. Um, and despite these differences, we can say that workers with disabilities uh, are often face the risk of exclusion, marginalization, and um, uh, discrimination. Uh, that's why there are uh, some uh, uh, special instruments that labor law do introduce, does introduce, uh, in order to uh, facilitate integration of persons with disabilities in the labor market. Of course, labor law instruments are not sufficient because uh, discrimination in the labor market is usually a consequence of discrimination of persons with disabilities in the field of education and mismatch between uh, study programs and uh, uh, real needs of, of the labor market. But when it comes to labor law, there are some specific forms uh, for employment of persons with disabilities. Uh, one of them is sheltered employment, uh, which uh, was actually in the past uh, connected with so-called medical model of disability. Uh, in, that medical model is connected with the approach that it is important for persons with disabilities to provide um, uh, good health care, social care, to orient uh, actually um, uh, persons with disabilities uh, towards uh, social benefits. And when it comes to employment, to actually uh, ensure their employment in uh, social enterprises or enterprises for professional rehabilitation and employment of persons with disabilities or specialized workshops, not to employ them at open market. Uh, of course, that was uh, uh, not a good solution. If we have in mind uh, uh, indecent, uh, indecent uh, working conditions in many uh, of those uh, working environments, and of course, um, uh, some kind of uh, ghettoization of workers working in special workshops uh, and uh, uh, social enterprises and so on. So today, uh, it seems acceptable uh, to have uh, sheltered employment uh, only uh, or primarily for employment of persons with disabilities uh, that are uh, so severe uh, forms of disability that it won't be uh, possible for workers to uh, be employed uh, otherwise, but just as a preparation or transition point to uh, employment on the open market. Uh, why? Because nowadays uh, predominant is a so-called social model of disability or a human-based a human rights based uh, model of uh, disability, which actually uh, stimulates uh, employment of persons with disabilities at the open market. Uh, and if that is, there is a need for that, with the reasonable accommodation of work process, uh, uh, work organization, working equipment to uh, special uh, needs of uh, persons with um, disabilities. Uh, however, there are uh, many uh, problems uh, regarding employment of persons with disabilities uh, and uh, uh, some uh, of those problems are tended to uh, be uh, uh, solved uh, by uh, implying quotas for employment of persons with disabilities, similar to those quotas for underrepresented sex. Here we have quotas for persons with disabilities, uh, which actually are connected with the obligation of employer to uh, employ a minimum number of persons with disabilities, usually 2 to 7 percent of um, uh, total number of uh, employees. Uh, however, this obligation uh, can be fulfilled uh, not just by uh, direct employment of persons with disabilities, but also uh, by um, uh, uh, some uh, or via some uh, alternative um, uh, obligation that has, has to be uh, fulfilled. So uh, as a result, uh, those quotas uh, cannot provide uh, some uh, big and important change uh, in the labor market. All those um, uh, challenges uh, that are uh, uh, that uh, persons with disabilities are uh, facing are uh, even more severe if we are talking about women with disabilities. Why? Because they are uh, facing uh, with combination of negative, uh, not just disability-based stereotypes, but also gender-based 
stereotypes. Uh, uh, that means that uh, uh, actually um, uh, there is a, a, a need to uh, take into account uh, the needs of uh, uh, women with disabilities, especially if they have family uh, duties. Uh, well, when it comes to men with disabilities, they are uh, more than women with disabilities encouraged to find employment, uh, to integrate uh, in a uh, labor market, while when it comes to women with disabilities, usually they are stimulated to uh, uh, use social benefits, and if uh, they uh, enter into employment relationship, that employment relationship is usually seen as um, something that will uh, allow them to somehow fill their time more than uh, to ensure their economic security and autonomy. Uh, also, in professional rehabilitation programs uh, for persons with disabilities, uh, men uh, with disabilities um, have priority uh, and more attention is often paid uh, to men with disabilities than uh, to women uh, with disabilities. Uh, if women with disabilities are mothers, they have more difficulties uh, of balancing professional and family duties than uh, men with disabilities. And this is particularly serious if we take into account uh, the fact that the services related to care uh, of children are um, uh, usually not um, adapted to special needs of mothers with disabilities. Uh, sometimes they are too expensive for them. And then um, uh, there is a tragedy uh, that uh, women with disabilities are not capable of being good uh, parents. And that can deter them from using support ser services due to the fear that uh, their child might be taken from them as a result of using um, uh, social, service, um, uh, social services. So th the issue is very, very uh, complex. Uh, and that can be illustrated by very high unemployment rates of women with disabilities all around uh, the world. Uh, for example, just 16% uh, of uh, women with disabilities is employed in Bulgaria, and that is the, the case for majority of European Union uh, uh, member states, uh, while the highest employment rate uh, is in Sweden, 75% of women uh, with disabilities is actually um, uh, employed. Uh, intersectional discrimination of women with disabilities is the uh, next question that we will briefly uh, examine. We will have time for that, I'm sure. Uh, well, uh, in uh, contemporary law, uh, protection against workplace discrimination uh, requires uh, to identify one discriminatory ground uh, for unequal treatment of job candidates uh, or employees. So the focus is always on only one ground of uh, discrimination. Uh, and when it comes to persons who are discriminated on, on two or more uh, personal characteristics, on the ground of two or more personal characteristics, they are, uh, in most of the cases, legally invisible. You will read judgments where uh, for example, claimants mentioned that uh, there are a uh, few grounds of discrimination, sex, gender, disability, ethnicity, and so on. But when it comes to judges, they will always look for uh, one ground that uh, is um, actually the most important in that certain case. So that means that, uh, for example, a woman with disability who cares for a young child will encounter additional difficulties if she wanted to attend a professional training compared to a man with disability as well as compared to uh, a woman with disability. That further means that there is a need uh, to actually introduce some new instruments to help uh, uh, finding uh, comparator uh, uh, when it comes to uh, this uh, intersectional discrimination because uh, different treatment uh, of women with disabilities is different regarding uh, men with disabilities, but also regarding women without disabilities. And that is also very a very delicate issue, how to actually uh, qualify uh, uh, certain, uh, uh, certain uh, comparator. Uh, so there are many, many other um, issues that uh, can be mentioned. And one possible way to solve this problem is to actually uh, implement uh, so-called uh, the concept of intersectionality, 
which was developed in 1980s, uh, firstly by Kimberle Crenshaw, and when it comes to intersectionality uh, regarding women with disabilities, it was especially developed by Jenny Morris in 1990s, and other authors actually later developed this um, uh, concept. Uh, it is uh, actually uh, connected with um, uh, the assumption that uh, consequences of discrimination based on disability and sex cannot be fully understood if considered in isolation or if simply added together because uh, consequences of intersectional discrimination are more severe if discrimination is grounded on two or more um, uh, uh, personal characteristics, as is the case with women with uh, disabilities. So there is a need actually for comprehensive analysis uh, of the grounds of discrimination um, uh, that are present in certain uh, case. Uh, and uh, uh, it is uh, also, uh, it can also be, um, uh, for example, illustrated by one case, and we will finish with that. Mm -hmm. I, uh, we have time yes, for that. Three, three minutes. Okay, three minutes. Uh, well, uh, there was one case uh, concerning an uh, employee who was a tax clerk uh, with an amputated leg, and uh, he required his employer to adapt the men's toilet to his needs. Employer proposed that he use uh, the woman's toilet because uh, toilet that was used uh, by uh, women was uh, accommodated uh, to uh, the needs of persons with disabilities. Um, and uh, that was uh, the uh, issue for uh, European Court of Human Rights to answer whether or not uh, this was uh, a permissible or there was a discrimination. You all know the European Court of Human Rights actually supervises the implementation of European F Convention for the Protection of Human Rights and Fundamental Freedoms. Uh, we don't have guarantees of right to work, uh, right, freedom of employment in uh, uh, that European Convention, but we do have some other uh, guarantees um, and uh, in order to uh, uh, have a violation of uh, certain right uh, uh, qualified, you have to have uh, actually uh, a legal basis. It has the guarantee of certain right that is um, uh, prescribed by a European Convention. So what do you think in this case? what uh, court, uh, European Court of uh, Human Rights um, uh, decided? and on which uh, actually guarantee uh, he established, uh, it established uh, a qualification of discrimination. He found discrimination, uh, sex-based discrimination, but regarding which uh, human right? <laughs> Do you have any idea? Because right to work is not guaranteed in this convention, nor freedom uh, of, uh, to choose occupation. Maybe there is no answer in the chat, but no. maybe here do we have some do we have some idea? Right to privacy, right to protection of mm -hmm. private life, because if you uh, spend eight hours at work each and single working day and have to, although you are a male use uh, women's toilet because it is accommodated to the needs of persons with disabilities and that male worker has uh, had amputated leg, then that will be actually discrimination regarding uh, right to privacy and also um, uh, violation of uh, right to uh, protection of private life. So maybe I can stop at this point. Thank you very much. There were so many issues that I would like to, to examine, maybe but uh, maybe there are some questions. Please, dear colleagues, or comments. You're all welcome, please. Are there any questions? No, maybe there are technical. In chat? No, just comments regarding previous uh, examples. Well, in that case, thank you very much for the, uh, yes, colleague, colleague Shuidovic, please. Just one brief question. So, uh, if I'm right, usually most uh, stereotypes uh, in uh, area of labor law come from uh, old uh, traditional patriarchal metrics. Is that actually true? Uh, 
Uh, well, yes, most of them, but not all of them, as we uh, talked about uh, stereotypes concerning using some, some other rights. But yes, yes, you were right. Thank you for it. So I have pleasure to use the, the last four minutes before an official closing our spring school. First, I want to thank to Professor Ljubinka for an excellent lecture and presentations and a very com complex uh, topics which she managed to present here in a short time. And so I'm happy that with so relevant course and field of positive law, of private law, we have been closing our uh, undertaking, our work. Uh, I must say that I feel very happy and sincerely fulfilled and happy and satisfied because I think that we managed to create the community. So since two weeks ago, we have been working very intensively. Some of you uh, did attend online or in class or in a com combined manner. But uh, uh, independently of that, I had all the time, in spite of the, f of the fact that we were limited in uh, our awareness ab about our colleagues from all uh, across the world, be but we, we, I felt that we all together have been the community of those devoted to a relevant issue. And uh, I'm sure that we will continue uh, dealing with these uh, gender, multiple gender, diversity and gender uh, topics in our professional work, in our uh, scholarship, in our further academic and professional interests. I want to say that it was a fantastic uh, thing that besides our participants from Belgrade, from the Faculty of Law, not only from Belgrade, from Serbia, a few more attendants. We also had, we have a fa fascinating uh, number of countries. Never, it doesn't matter that one or only two persons are from different countries, but if you have uh, participants from, I, I have just shortly to list from Italy, Vietnam, Croatia, China, France, India, Albania, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Montenegro, Braz Brazil, Germany, Iran, uh, Russia, Bel 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 Belarus, Bel Bel Russia. I, I am not sure. So that really is something very relevant. So we we have been uh, the community, in the really international one. So I hope that you uh, uh, between each other also will. Uh, make some kind of the networking. So you have the Moodle, for, through Moodle, through email uh, list, you can contact each other. We also will be in contacts uh, further on. We will announce, you will have Mood, uh, Moodle rich uh, content on your disposal. And I will also upload the, the book on disability and uh, girls and female uh, di disability issues. And uh, we will be in contact. Before I uh, close, I want to express my sincere gratitude first to our attendants from different countries and, and from our country. I want to express my sincere gratitude to all professors. You saw, you could feel, I'm sure, how devoted, how deeply going and, uh, uh, in, into different topics they have been doing all the time. It does not ma mean that we all cannot go further on and make more and uh, richer uh, insights about all, but this starting point, I think, has been the promising one. So we have uh, the very solid basis, high quality basis for and reaching further on and making more in-depth uh, knowledge and transferring and developing that uh, also with you, the attendants. I especially want to express my gratitude to the OSC mission to Serbia 
and to the especially to the representative of the OSCE mission to Serbia, Milana Jevtić. Uh, believe or not, Milana and I and uh, a few of my colleagues, you see that this is the teamwork. It's so obvious to all of you that I couldn't do anything alone. So without the common work of my colleagues, uh, younger and older, without uh, uh, the support of the administrative staff, high level and high quality IT staff, etc., etc., I would, wouldn't be able to do anything. But without Milena and without their support and without OSC mission, we would not be able to do as much as we uh, have done, and uh, I'm sure that we will uh, go on with our cooperation for the, for the better of, of the Faculty of Law and uh, of the quality of knowledge which we can share with all of you and with other generations. I think that the next year we will uh, have another spring, summer, or autumn, who knows, never mind, we will have I hope one more sco school uh, as the tool for uh, preparing uh, us uh, professors from the Faculty of Law for uh, implementing, for conducting uh, the master study program Law and Gender when it uh, finally will be accredited. Just to mention once again what I said previously, our colleagues from other universities, consortium members, or other international scholars will also join us because we really have the interest to give the best, we to give the best, and also to give the opportunity to other colleagues from other universities to join us in doing the best. So I think that uh, the ambassador uh, of uh, and the head of uh, the OSCE mission to Serbia is coming very soon, I believe so, because I think that Milena left and maybe she is waiting for him. So now uh, we, we will have a short break. Or, so, yes, <laughs> thank you. Thank, thank you. So now we can maybe, while wait, so our colleagues from the, those the, who have been online today, thank you for participation. Uh, and I'm s really sorry that you do not have the privilege to be with us now here, because uh, we are waiting for the delivery of, of certificates in person to those who have been here. And we are waiting for the ambassador, Jan Brathu, uh, the head of uh, the OIC mission to Serbia, to come and deliver the certificates. However, we will be in contact. And uh, please do not he hesitate to contact me. And if you want, uh, more direct co contact with all other professors. I'm sure that you liked most some of them or some topic uh, is of your greatest interest, so do not hesitate to contact me or them uh, without my help. And uh, our IT Petter, who helped me a lot all the time, uh, told me uh, one or two hours ago that, that he uh, did upload the evaluation form. I think that it is at Moodle. I'm yeah, not yeah, sure. At Mo so please, please send us your feedback. And if I forgot something, never. it doesn't matter. So thank you very much. And uh, with this, we will close this uh, uh, online part of our being together. Thanks once again, and uh, bye. And the, our spring school is closed. <laughs> Thank you.